magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Presented as a public service by Standard Oil Company. of wind and water, yet more powerful than any hydrogen bomb, hurricanes strike simultaneously on both sides of the globe. In the east, in Japan, where the savage storms are called typhoons, thundering waves are licked by hundred mile an hour gales as they smash the shore. In this season alone, this is the ninth of the typhoons that have struck from the skies to scar men's lives. The turbulent winds and torrential rain send floodwaters swirling far inland on Kyushu, southernmost of the four main Japanese islands. Fire comes at night, writing in its red glare a new log of heartbreak. Dawn brings a scene of complete and utter desolation. Thousands homeless and millions of dollars in damage in the wake of Typhoon Number 9. A few days later, Typhoon number 12 unleashes a new wave of destruction against the storm-lashed Kyushu. Heavily populated offshore islands are at the mercy of the fierce wind and boiling sea. Ruins and rubble are all that remain. Typhoons 9 and 12 have left a gnarled tree as a tombstone of disaster. But back in school, children turn from the tragedy of yesterday to the promise of tomorrow. On another coast, half a world away, Hurricane Flossie weaves a destructive way across the Gulf states. Spawn in the Gulf of Mexico, the erratic storm swings first against the Louisiana shore. The counterclockwise pinwheel winds turn gentle tides into frenzied breakers. Strange, unpredictable, striking only in the late summer and fall, hurricanes suck up billions of gallons of water before storming onto land. Trees seemingly bow in awe, and men are helpless. There is no stopping the winds that sometimes reach 200 miles an hour. A wall of water rolls across the countryside, swollen by the deluge poured down by Hurricane Flossie. Small streams become raging torrents, rumbling over rich farmlands. Lake Pontchartrain, just north of New Orleans, is buried beneath the flood. Rescue workers brave the swift currents to search the area for survivors. The waters rise to waist height. A city lies paralyzed. Mailboxes become measuring sticks. Swerving eastward, Flossie brushes Alabama and vents her fury on the northeast Florida coast. The battered buildings and shattered ships, flung far up on the shore, testify to the awesome might of Hurricane Flossie. But there is beauty too in the windswept sand that looks like snow. A barren landscape stroked by nature's brush. A stark and lonely scene left behind as the hurricane winds race on across the countryside. A replica of the historic Mayflower, in which the Pilgrims sailed to America in 1620, gradually takes form in a little English shipyard. Chiseled with fine Elizabethan craftsmanship, solid oak timbers flare from the keel into the beautifully shaped frame. Prepared now for launching, the reborn Mayflower weighs 180 tons and is 90 feet long. Some of the wood used in her construction is 500 years old. A goodwill gift from the people of Britain to those of America, the 20th century Mayflower will sail next year from Plymouth, England to Plymouth, Massachusetts, an Atlantic crossing recalling the epic voyage of our pilgrim pioneers. An Air Force plane framed by clouds and trees sweeps into position for a daring demonstration by America's jumping medics. Their target is a tiny clearing deep in the woods. 
The pinpoint drops are designed to give medics the skill to parachute into areas where no other means of rescue is possible. Trained to thread his way through the trees, a jumper lands safely and has his leap measured for accuracy. Even densely wooded areas, where it is impossible to reach the ground, do not discourage the paramedic, for in time of emergency, he must be ready to jump and land anywhere. In a grim Poznan courthouse, Polish workers who took part in the recent Bread and Freedom riots are brought to trial. The commissars in charge offer these weapons in evidence against the young heroes, described by the Reds as hooligans and criminals. But these films of the defendants refute the communists, revealing the youths as anything but vicious looking criminals. A fact that, with the fear of new riots, compels the Reds to mete out only token prison terms. In other days, the sentence for defiance behind the Iron Curtain would have been death. St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City is elaborately decorated for one of the Roman Catholic Church's most solemn ceremonies, a beatification that will proclaim as blessed Pope Innocent XI. Pope Pius XII presides at the devout ritual, attended by a congregation of 30,000. The subject of this step toward sainthood is Innocent XI, who served his pontificate in the 17th century and rallied the Christian West against the invading infidels from the East. Though born to wealth and influence, Pope Innocent's service as the Vicar of Christ was marked by a spirit of humility and a life of self-sacrifice. A six-wheeled armored car that can go like 60 is one of Britain's latest military vehicles. Another is this tank which can climb a 30-degree slope without a slip. When sidewalls are added, the same centurion can float, heavy as it is, crossing streams and continuing on its way. Britain is proudest of this little jeep, which can be completely submerged except for its exhaust. The jeep keeps gurgling along fine, but it's a little tough on passengers who float. Wait for me! To the Mohawks, the blunt cape was Cheronderoga, the place where two waters meet. To the French, who built a fort here, it was Ticonderoga, the name mistakenly written down by Champlain. Three nations fought over the fort, shaped like a star so its cannon could command every avenue of attack. And in the 18th century, Ticonderoga was the key to a continent. A century in colonial costume strides from the shadows of a turbulent time 200 years ago, when America's future was forged at Fort Ticonderoga. France's Marquis de Montcalm, England's Lord Geoffrey Amherst, America's Ethan Allen, all once walked the ramparts of the most faithfully restored revolutionary war fortress in America today. Ticonderoga was a miracle of colonial construction. 3,000 men labored through three summers to erect the walls, mount the guns, and raise the barracks. The fort's military importance stemmed from its location, overlooking the place where Lake George empties into Lake Champlain on the water highway between New York Harbor and the St. Lawrence River. During the American Revolution and the years just before, it was clear that Ticonderoga was the key to this waterway through the mountains. To control the key was to control the route, and with it, the destinies of a continent. So it was that history was made and made again at the fort. Here, more than a year before the Declaration of Independence, Ethan Allen stormed the mighty bastion with less than a hundred Green Mountain boys. After his men had overpowered the fort's lookouts, Allen strode up these stairs to demand and receive the surrender of Ticonderoga in the name of the great Jehovah and the Continental Congress. The fort became an outpost of American power. From it, Benedict Arnold launched one prong of his unsuccessful invasion of Canada. 
England's kilted Royal Highlanders marched with the Burgoyne expedition that recaptured Ticonderoga in 1777. Although King George exclaimed, I have beat them, I have beat all the Americans, Burgoyne's victory was but a prelude to the turning point of the revolution, the defeat of the British army at Saratoga. Ticonderoga's military importance had come to an end, but during 20 embattled years, the flags of three nations had flown in its courtyard. Under the French banner, Montcalm hurled back the first English attack in 1758. The British flag flew triumphant a year later when Lord Amherst overran the bastion with 12,000 men. The Cambridge flag, which bore the Union Jack and 13 stripes, was the first American ensign to wave over Ticonderoga. A circle of 13 stars replaced the Union Jack when the colonies proclaimed their independence in 1776. 180 years later, Fort Ticonderoga remains a symbol of the liberty to which our founding fathers pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. The key to a continent had become a fountainhead of our freedom, a hallowed shrine that is today a living part of America's heritage. in many lands, mountains are an ageless challenge. To these climbers in the Kayatoni range of Japan, the sheer peaks are a call to high adventure. Another kind of adventurer follows the rapid snaking river far below. He is the raftsman who rides a shipment of logs lashed together to a lumber mill at the foot of the Kumano River. For hundreds of years, the treacherous river has been the only means of transporting the timber from the remote forest-clad slopes in the mountains. Like passing thread through the eye of a needle, the two raftsmen, with but a single pole each, pass the logs through a dangerous squeeze in the surging river. A mountain challenge that is, for the raftsmen, a way of life. To the scientists who come to mystic Tibet, the Karakoram Range is a source of giant glaciers whose icy streams run milky white. Stretching westward into northern India and Kashmir, the towering range has 60 peaks over 20,000 feet high. Outside the Arctic and the Antarctic, this is the third largest glacial region in the world. Standing on a melting glacier, the expedition sees a trickle of water that swells quickly into a swift stream. Starting high in the mountains, glaciers are mighty rivers of ice formed from compressed snow. Boulders like this one, so big it dwarfs the man at its base, are carried and rounded off by the glacier as it grinds down the mountainside under its own weight. A giant glacial gem polished by a crystal river of ice. To the men who ride trains into the Pyrenees Mountains of Spain, the lofty peaks are a portrait of shimmering beauty. A natural boundary, the Pyrenees stretch 270 miles along the French and Spanish border. To these climbers, the challenge is men and skis against the slopes. Their search is not for science, but for sport on a winter holiday in the Pyrenees. For the tourist who comes to the French Alps, a cable car sweeps out of the sky toward the town of Chamonix. This steep cableway is the longest in the world. It was built to serve the thousands of visitors who travel each year from the Alpine village on the high road to Mont Blanc. Strong cables stretch over the valley, serving as aerial tracks for the rising railway. Chamonix is green with summer as the car slowly climbs higher and higher. But as the ride in the clouds continues, the warmth of summer gives way to autumn's chilling winds, and patches of snow fringe the dizzy crags. Autumn yields quickly to winter as the car passes over the snow line, the point above which there is snow all the year round. 
Amid the spectacular scenery, the cable railway nears the end of the line, high on 12,000 foot Aguille du Mead mountain. The tourists can lift their eyes in search of Mont Blanc, called by the poet Byron, the monarch of the mountains. Or they can look down with wonder at Chamonix. Its home's a cluster of specks in a valley below. Japan, Tibet, Spain, France. Their peaks are timeless challenges in the story of man and the mountains. Italian luxury liner Andrea Doria ran by the Stockholm listed beyond reclaim in the Atlantic on the morning of July 26, 1956. The greatest sea rescue in history was to save almost 1,700 survivors huddled in open lifeboats. But the Doria was doomed. There was a time when the sinking ship would have been a ship lost from human sight forever. But we are to see her again. Even as hearings to determine the cause of the disaster go forward in New York, an expedition of diver photographers undertakes a perilous assignment to find and film the hulk of the sunken Andrea Doria. Their ship is the Samuel Jameson. Skipper John Mulligan steers toward the liner's grave while a crewman scans the surface and an electronic lookout called a pathometer probes the ocean bottom. Chief diver Frederick Dumas is asleep storing his strength for a 15-minute dive that is more exhausting than eight hours work on land. Author James Dugan and diver John Light, expedition organizers and their crewmen, cite the escaping oil from the Doria that still covers the water six weeks after the sinking. The pathometer has found the Doria too. The smudge at far right, looking like a fingerprint, is an actual silhouette of the ship. Dumas watches as the pathometer, by recording sound waves bounced off the sunken Doria, sketches four profiles during four passes over the hull. Floor plans of the liner are brought out and studied by Dumas and the others. Diver Louis Mal, who has come from France with Dumas, checks the expedition's revolutionary underwater camera, so sensitive it can film deep sea details that the human eye cannot see. Next, a weighted descent line is dropped. So precise are the calculations that the weight pierces a porthole just 12 feet from the liner's dead center. Now a dinghy is dropped overboard, and bobbing like a cork on the choppy seas, a Jameson crewman anchors it to the descent line. Both divers wear warm underwear under their tight exposure suits, for the ocean depths are bitter cold. Mal has powdered the slick rubber so that it will slip on easily, and his face is streaked white. Dumas, at 43, has made 10,000 dives and holds the world's depth record using an aqualung. The 23-year-old Mal, co-director of the motion picture The Silent World, starts down, holding the special camera. Underwater, Mal's camera follows Dumas down. At first, he moves through a zone of warm water. Then suddenly he strikes a cold, fast-moving current. He checks the luminous dial of his depth indicator. He is down 130 feet. Far above, the crew is battling a menacing, deadly shark. Unaware, the divers continue downward. Icy water stinging head and hands. The descent continues with seemingly agonizing slowness, while the shark fights stubbornly for its freedom. Mal points to Dumas' depth indicator, 160 feet. Their eyes probe the shadowless twilight. And there she is, the once proud Andrea Doria, entombed in her eternal resting place. A davit comes into remarkable focus as Mal's underwater camera follows Dumas along the ship's left side. Her right side, with its gaping hole, is pressed into the sand. Ranging along the Doria's hull, Dumas fights the dreaded enemy of free divers, the rapture of the depths. The nitrogen in the compressed air Dumas is breathing begins to act like a narcotic. Wits are dulled and caution is forgotten. It takes a trained will to survive. Suddenly a new peril threatens Dumas. 
His suit has become overinflated, and he is in danger of rising out of control to the surface, almost certain death. So, after eight minutes on the Doria, a forced ascent begins. Duma must fight against the powerful buoyancy inside his suit that wants to sweep him straight up. He struggles to wrap the descent line around his ankle as a brake. And he makes it. He must let the pressure in his ears equalize with the pressure of the air in his mouth and lungs, or his eardrums will burst. Nearing the surface, Duma has to be careful to avoid the bends, which are also produced by the nitrogen in his compressed air. He waits just below the surface to let the nitrogen escape without forming bubbles inside his body. With Duma in the lead, the two divers surface, 13 minutes after the start of their descent into the Atlantic's forbidding depths. Further dives are impossible. Mal's left ear is caked with blood. His eardrum has burst. The Samuel Jameson, the dead shark lashed to her stern, heads for port, carrying this pictorial record of a dead ship, the Andrea Doria, hidden below the changeless seascape of the Atlantic Ocean.